God, make sure you reach out to every person in your family. You may not know how important it is to them to be told that you love them and you do care for them, that they're special, that they matter. Praise the Lord. Have you heard conversations about or where a guy somehow musters up all his courage and all his energy and tries to prepare himself and approaches a lady he likes romantically, not knowing how to go about it. He prepares himself, but finally this is the day. He doesn't know if he has to come closer. He does not know if he has to hold her hand so that it'll be more romantic. So he prepares his voice, trying to be as sincere and how he could come out as, as sincere as possible and at the same time preserve that baritone timbre. He doesn't want it to come out a soprano, you know. So he takes a deep breath, decided or undecided. But finally, he comes closer and with a half whisper and at the same time, understandable enough. He finally lets out the words, I love you. And as if that was not enough, after he says the words, I love you, as much as possible, he expects a very quick response from the lady. But then it doesn't come right away. So the more he gets nervous, every breath becomes more tense. The atmosphere for him becomes more tense as well. The lady looks up, smiles a little bit, and then the smiles off her face. He looks down again. It's becoming more suspenseful for him. What is she going to say? Finally, the lady nods a little bit, but then shakes her head. Then she lets go of these words. I don't have the ability to love. I'm so sorry. Now, we could make a novel out of this, but we're not here to do that this morning. But I think what I want to point out is how hurtful those words are for the person who is expecting to be loved. And this is very important because it has so much to do with the message that we have this morning. Very relevant, very pertinent. And some of you, some of you may be experiencing this in your life. And that is this. In the last days, we've been going through the characteristics that the Apostle Paul told Timothy about how it's going to be in the last days. And one of those very important characteristics of that generation or generations is this, that they're going to be unloving. They're going to be unloving. The main text we have is found in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This is what it says. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. <clears throat> Stay away from people like that. So the sort of a review um, what we've tackled so far based on verse 2, we've had these characteristics of the people of the generation or generations living in the last days. Number one, they'll be self-lovers. Number two, they will be money lovers. Number three, they'll be boastful. Number four, they will be proud. Number five, they'll be God scoffers. Number six, they'll be disobedient to parents. 
Number seven, they will be ungrateful. Number eight, they will be unholy. And the NLT was considered, it is rendered as they will be consider nothing sacred. And the last time I preached, I brought you this. Unholy and profane in the Amplified. So we continue in our part six of the message. Found in verse three again of Second Timothy chapter three, the Apostle Paul telling Timothy this. He said, they will be unloving. They will be unloving. In the NIV, it is translated simply as they will be without love, without love. In the King James Version, it says without natural affection. Unloving, without love, without natural affection. So you're putting these words together. Love is a natural feeling. Love is a natural affection. But they're going to be without that. And then in the Amplified, it expands expounds it more by rendering it as they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, callous and inhumane. Do you hear that? That is heavy. That is heavy. Unloving, callous, without love, without natural affection, devoid of human affection. And the last word, inhuman or inhumane, inhumane. So that pretty much covers all the possible meanings of it. So when you talk about that, I cannot blame some of you if your mind goes right away to the possibility of when you talk about, about that, that generation being unloving or inhumane or inhuman, could that be a possibility that it is referring as well to the rise of, of robots or AIs that yes they're able to function with artificial intelligence and they move probably like human beings but they don't really have the capacity to love but of course we know that people who develop AIs also try to develop their emotions programmed emotions which is definitely it definitely doesn't really matter in the sight of God because in the eyes of God robots and AIs are not responsible and they don't have accountability so I'm going to concentrate on the alternative, meaning to say when it talks about it talks about being unloving, it is referring to you and to me. It is referring to people of the world. I would say not to you and to me. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this does not refer to you and to me. It refers to those who are of the world system. That world, that generation, or those generations will be void of love. No, there are only two times that this word was used or is used in the New Testament. The other one is found in Romans 1. And I'm going to read to you instead of just verse 31. So you see the context where you would notice that where Paul uses this for Timothy, when he writes to the Romans, it is almost the same thought and context. So I want you to just listen to this and read it together with me. You read it get on your screen. Because this is the context of it, but we end with verse 31, where it again reveals more of the meaning of being unloving in this generation, or in the last day's generation. Romans 1, 20 to 31 says, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them. Listen, it says He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. And here we go, verse 31. But it sounds so much like the verses we read in 2 Timothy. And verse 31 says, They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. The word rendered as unloving is rendered here in Romans as heartless. It's one and the same. They will be without love. So people, 
in this generation may be running after and valuing IQ very much or probably social stuff very much or even how to fight adversity or self-help. They may be very good at that in the last generation, but one thing they're going to lose mm -hmm. is their capacity to love, or probably they may have that, but it's just that they've lost love. It's a love loss, and that's a very sad state to find yourself in. You may not realize how tragic that is, but a world without love is a very tragic world. A life that is unloved is a very tragic life. An unloving life is a very tragic life. So what you're going to see is in the world, in the last, the world in the last days, it's going to be a very sad kind of world. And people are not even realizing that. That's the reason in, de in this context, so see, when you see that context, the more you understand it, when the Lord Jesus Christ said something almost prophetic when he was here on earth, it was hard to understand. But now when you see that context, what you're seeing is that the Lord actually makes sense. When he said, Matthew 10, 21, 22, listen to this. A brother will betray his brother to death. Did you hear that? How can that be, you ask? Unloving. A father will betray his own child, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. You know, when I see people hurting others, it hurts me. When I see videos of people, like really uncaringly, just like out of nowhere, hurts other people. It's like, why do it? It's a common and like natural question that comes out or rises out of my heart is, why do they do that? How can they do that? And then you see the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like if the Lord says that the father will hurt or will mean harm to the kids and the kids to their siblings and kids to their parents, if within their family they could do all of those things, it's very understandable now how people without relationships could do it to each other. But then again, I ask, when a person becomes unloving and a generation becomes unloving, the question I ask is, does it even matter if you have any relationships? Does it even matter if you're related to a family member or anyone else? Because if you're unloving, it doesn't really matter. It is easy for you to hurt. It is easy for the world to hurt others because of that. So this is something I'd like to like show to you because, again, that characteristic runs directly contrary to God's will. And a lot of you, I have a few verses that I wanted to read here just revealing to you God's heart regarding love. You're, you're very familiar with this context or concept. And I don't have to read a lot to you, but I'm going to skip some of the verses. I'm just going to go to two to show you what the heart of God is when it comes to us, us loving each other instead of the opposite that's going to happen in the last days. Romans 13, verse 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. What is it saying? I owe you. You owe me too. We actually owe each other. Okay? So, what it's saying, what it's saying is, if there's something you got to owe, don't owe the visa and discover and all of those places and all these things. What we have to owe is this. We are indebted to each other with love. We got to keep on loving each other. And then the next thing is 1 Corinthians 16, 14, where it says, and do everything with love. Do you hear that? Do everything, as in everything. When you say everything, that's it. Every act we take has to be birthed out of love. So I'm not going to read to you all these verses, but sometimes we ask, like, how, how did people lose their love? And there's a lot of reasons. I don't have time 
to enumerate all the possible reasons why a person could lose love or the generation, it's like the entire generation could lose love. I could give you a little bit, like perhaps people have been hurt deeply by people they love and they don't want to be hurt again. Probably people got hurt because of love many times, repeatedly, and they don't want to be hurt again. They are protecting themselves from the pain because the greatest pain that you and I, one of the, if not the superlative, sometimes is very hard to use because people do, there will always be exceptions. But one of the most painful experiences a person could ever have is when a person is betrayed in love. That's the reason why we understand why people would not want to involve themselves. That's the reason why the lady in the beginning could answer, I'm sorry, I don't have the ability to love. Not because she started with it, but she has learned to protect herself so that they would be spared, or be spared from any further pain caused by love. If I may just ask you in this congregation, you and in your homes as well, honestly speaking, how many of you here have been hurt because of love? Oh, yeah? Got about four? That's good. Praise God for you haven't been hurt because of love. No, Pastor, I'm three years old. Okay, that's good. But you know, for those of you who have loved someone and, and it has been was not reciprocated or loves... You, you love, if you have loved someone and then you got betrayed, that stings, that cuts deep. I could read to you comments upon comments of people who have expressed the, the feelings of pain that they've had. How could I love you so much that I forgot to look at my pain because I love you so much when I realized you really didn't care for me and didn't love me? A lot more of those you could feel. The moment you read those comments, you could almost feel the pain and the depths of the cut and the wound and a prevailing feeling that they have about this that they are having a hard time overcoming because it's hard. So what's something that a lot of people don't realize is it's very important when you talk about love lost, don't ever undermine the seriousness of that because a person or a generation or a country that loses love loses so much. I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians 13, 1, 7. Very familiar verses, but it'll give you a glimpse of something you and I lose and people lose when they lose love. Very familiar, especially in weddings. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had a gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whether or whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Did you notice how beautiful those virtues and values are? So think about that definition or characteristics of love as it was expounded or ex enumerated to us, the characteristics, and think about unloving. By the way, that word unloving is, again, A, it's almost like negating love, so taking away what love is. So if you would just look at these verses again, I could go through this, and now what happened? These are the things that were lost, and now instead of those beautiful virtues, this is now how you would read it. When the world and a person has become unloving. What is that? You could read it this way. Instead of being patient, people are impatient. Instead of being kind, they are unkind. Instead of be, not being jealous, boastful, or rude, they are. 
They demand their own way. They are irritable. They keep records of being wrong. They rejoice about injustice, and they don't rejoice when truth wins out. They give up. They lose faith. They're not hopeful. They don't endure their circumstances. Can you see how terrible that kind of world is when people start losing love and they start acting the opposite of love? You don't want this in your home. You, won't, you don't want this in your family. You don't want this in your workplace. You don't want this in this country. You don't want this in your community or school. Love is such a beautiful thing that the absence of it is considered by some as what they call you know what they say? World without love is like hell on earth. That's how valuable love is. But then these people are going to be unloving. And if you look at verses one um down through three, I would just summarize it to you. If you look at those verses once again, what it's saying is that to be unloving means to be nothing. Did you see that on those verses? Because it mentions about gifts. But if you look at this, it doesn't matter how gifted a person is. The Bible is saying it's for nothing. It doesn't matter how eloquent they are. They mean nothing. It doesn't matter how wise or how powerful they are. The Bible says they are nothing. It doesn't matter how much good they do and how much they sacrifice. The Bible says they gain nothing. It eradicates the formula that God has given to us, even this natural formula and spiritual principle and law, wherein the Bible says, whatever you sow, you reap. If you give and if you plant, if you sacrifice for someone, but it's void of love, the Bible says you gain nothing. We definitely destroy even this very supernatural and spiritual principle that works all the time, except now you've canceled it out because you took away the greatest motivation in doing these things. When I say this, I don't want you to feel like lowly or sulking and sad, especially if you're a believer. I'm, pic I'm showing you a picture of a dreadful existence that's going to happen in the last days. But you and I as believers exist and will exist in the last days. And this will speak so much about how important and how significant your life and mine are. Some of, you t some of us are, have been told that many times over. What is that? You're important. Your life matters. You're valuable as believers. The world may hate you, but it does not matter. You don't mean anything. But in the light of what we're talking about, I'm going to show you how valuable and how essential you are. Okay? Can you tell this to yourself? I am important. I am essential. Say it again. I am, I am essential. How essential are you? Because as the world grows deeper, grows um, dark, darker and more evil and more wicked and more unloving, this is where Christians become wider in their gap from the world. There's just a polarization that happens. Because honestly speaking, you may not know it, but the world itself, whether, whether they're losing love or not, but yes, in the last days it will. The world that's losing love know the value of love. Did you hear me? The world that's losing love know the value of love. That's why we have heard these words and lyrics from songs before. What is that? Love makes the world go round. Right? And, and I understand that. Love makes the world go round. Perhaps another take on that one is it is love that makes you want to keep the world going around. Because some people who are, not, who are not love don't want the world to keep going. But they say that. Love makes the world go around. John Lennon has a very famous song, All You Need Is Love. All You Need Is Love. So the world is... John Lennon may have been spiritual one time in a very brief moment of his life. But he's not a very spiritual person at all. That's based on the words he says and all of those things. But he values love. Well, in fact, he, he elevates it to a supreme, like all you need is love. And then I think Captain and Tennille, is that, I don't know how you call it, but they said love will keep us together. You know that song. 
So even the, 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 the world knows the value of what love is. And now listen carefully. That's the reason why I said I want to say that because, because the world knows how important what love is. Even if they've lost it, it doesn't change the reality that love is important. But the beautiful thing about this is as Christians, you and I are the one who will fill the void. That's how essential you are. Whatever is lacking in the world, you and I are filling it up. Praise God. God has placed you in me. Now, we've heard it before. Jesus is the answer. God is the hope of this world. What God is saying, yes, I'm the hope of this world. Jesus is the answer. Now I'm sending you as my representatives. There's a reason why you and I are the light of the world. You and I are the salt of the earth. When you talk about love, there are three things in relation to believers that I like to point out when you talk about it. Nature, mandate, and knowability. Nature, mandate, and knowability. When you talk about nature, it is because it becomes natural for us. As believers, we don't even have to struggle to love. Why? Because it's natural. Love lives in you. Love is natural in you. It's in there. And then talks about mandate. The reason why we love is because we were commanded by God to love. It is a mandate. Mandate that we have, that we have, we are responsible to obey. And in no ability, the Bible tells us it is because of that love of ours that we will be known as two disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at those verses, 1 John 4, 7, and 8, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves or who loves is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And we, we hear about Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Remember the mandate? This is what it says. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The mandate. And then John 13, 35 talks about, and By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Those are the words that explains to you or shows and proves to you what I just said. That we are related. When we talk about love, Christians are the answer the world's waiting for. How many of you go to like, some stores and you see this you probably have this in your homes it has actually surpassed I just read it has surpassed you know very, the very common posters that says keep calm and then something's added they said that this posters and, and decorations have surpassed that live love laugh have you heard of that live love laugh when I told you when I told you that the world longs for this because not, not, not every person who bought that are Christians or is a Christian. A lot of people in the world values that, live, love, laugh. But if you look at it, do you see how significant Christians are? Because those, those words and values and experiences are only real in its purest form among believers. Why is that? When you talk about living, Jesus Christ said, the thief came to steal, to kill, and destroy, John 10:10. 10, 10. But I came to give life, and to give it a more, to give it more abundantly. Who gives life? Jesus. And then love, First John 4:8. God is love. And you talk about laugh. The Bible tells us the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy. So we see the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all together working to bring that to you and to me. What is that? To live, to love, and to laugh. That's the reason why Christians bear that in our hearts. Amen? That's the reason why we could bring that to others. In a world that is losing love, in a world that is living in deep darkness, in a very sad and tragic state, in a world where they're losing things that are beautiful, you and I come along. And we're able to bring them that which people have actually lost. And this becomes a reality to you, that living, the loving, the life. We're going to give you time later on because that could only become a reality. If you're listening to us and you still have not experienced the beauty of that gift that God has given us, His love through 
his son Jesus Christ and you want to experience you want to experience the purest form of love and laughter and living we're going to ask you to receive Christ later on that's all you got to do that's all you got to do so let go of yourself and all your sins turn away from it and then come to God receive his son and you will be cleansed of your sin, and that joy that God has will live in you brought by the Holy Spirit. That joy that you are longing for, that love you are craving for, that life that you want so desperately to enjoy, it will become a reality to you. Now, there's a lot of things that I'd like to explain more about. <clears throat> I'm encouraging everyone, Christians, believers, you are very significant. Your life matters. Your life matters as all lives do. But always remember that God has placed you here with a very important mission. One of them is to show the love of God to other people. It does not have to be. So the beautiful thing about Christians is we don't have to wait for people to love us, for us to love them. You know why? Because our love is not dependent upon what people do to us. Our love is dependent upon the presence of God inside of us. Amen. So whether they love us or not, we could love them back. Amen? No, no, not love them back because they don't love you. Okay, so whether they love us or not, we could love them because God first loved us. We love Him. We love other people because God first loved us. We could initiate. We don't have to wait for people to love us. We initiate it. And by the way, those of you who are here, do that in your homes. Do that in your homes. Don't wait for your husband. Don't wait for your dad. Don't wait for your mom. You do it. You keep on initiating love. It doesn't have to be a big-time thing. Just be deliberate about it. Even as simple as like when they're talking, you're listening to them, right? And encouraging them. Instead of like while they're talking, you're yawning and then showing disinterest. Don't do that. But in simple things like that, love on them. Show that you care. Show that you appreciate them. And what a, wonder, what a beautiful, what a wonderful, what a great world we're going to have. And we are having because we are people filled with the love of God and we're spreading it all over. Um. I just saw a video, by the way, um, and um, it's an animated film, very short one. You probably have seen this, where um, a, um, a, an elderly man got in the bus, and he, had a, he was holding a cane, and he was trying to like, look for a seat that he could sit down, where he could sit down. There were no free seats, and nobody was offering him seats as, any seat as well. And, and the reason why is because he has a ticket, but it says no, no seat ticket. Like it's a no seat ticket. So he's expected to actually stand up. But eventually, a young lady, uh, not too young, a, a lady stood up and offered him the seat. And so he accepted. They were going to travel for about five more hours. And so the lady was just like standing there. And finally, the elderly gentleman uh, fell asleep and felt comfortable. And while he was asleep, several hours into the trip, the the train conductor is that is that how you call him as well here? Train conductor, right? The train conductor started checking to see the the tickets, and and when he got to the guy, he saw the ticket of the elderly gentleman, and it says no seat. But then he didn't get he didn't bother waking him up because somehow the lady who was standing right beside the guy quietly stealthily and conspicuously like signaled or gestured to the man that i have the ticket she has was a wood seat ticket okay so she she she, she gestured that and so the the conductor just left him alone and finally after about almost five hours of traveling um the man was still asleep the lady was going to go down and she got down ahead of him and the video showed how when she was about to go, before she left, but before she started walking, she grabbed hold of two crutches because she herself needed those crutches to walk. Her condition was probably worse than the elderly gentleman who just had a cane. She needed those crutches to walk, but she was willing to sacrifice that seat. You know, they said love and sacrifice truly really matters when you also give up, when you actually give up something that you do need for yourself. 
the, the video doesn't show that that was love, but it was good. But whether it was love or not, one thing we could be sure is that that was an act of love. That was a very loving act. A world that is unloving will not have any of those. But you and I are entrusted by God with something so precious. We can save this world. Yes, I know those of you who are super spiritual. Jesus can save this world. But he works through you and me. You're that important. The smile, the life, the mobility, the zoe in you, the enthusiasm, the energy, the love and the care and the tenderness that you do possess, that we share with each other as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the world is looking for. You may say I'm only one person. doesn't matter. You may, just, you, you may touch just one person. You may, just, you may just touch one. You may touch two. You may touch ten or scores or hundreds. But let's say, for example, it doesn't even go there. If you could just touch one person with your love, it's worth it all. Um, before, I, before I pray, there is a song that I remember and I was a very young boy, lived with my parents, with my, my siblings. And they started singing a song that somehow got etched in my heart. They all became Christians earlier than I did. So I don't know if, I don't know if, if they were Christians when they learned this song or because they were very active, because they were very active. My brothers were very active in Girl Scout. I don't know how that happened, but. They were very active in the Girl Scout Academy. I think they were Boy Scouts, and they were asked to train the Girl Scouts, so that's what happened. So I don't know where they learned it, but what I want to do is for us to sing this. And as you sing this, I want you to meditatively sing this, not just in passing, because it is very important. It talks about your significance, and what you can do, how you could impact the world around us, even with you, and just one person. So sing it from your heart. Sing it meditatively. I don't know who's going to help me with um, with the song, but I want you all to sing it. Okay, I want you all to sing it. Yeah. I sent it on the church, uh, fam, FCF fam group me. So if you want to join, I know uh, the Ezekiel knows this song. So for those of you who are at home, join us. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ah, thank you. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And though and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing that's how it is in God's love once you've experienced it you spread his love to everyone you want to time is spring when all the trees are budding the birds begin to sing the flowers start their blooming that's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it you want to sing, it's fresh like spring, you want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I've found. 
you can depend on him it matters not where you're bound I shouted from the mountaintop I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me I want to pass it on. I'll shout it out. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass. Praise the Lord. I'll shout it from the mountain tops. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me and I want to pass it on. Would you pass it on? Would you pass it on? All it takes is part. That's you, the light of the world. If you are one of those people who are desiring in your heart to experience this beautiful love of God that believers do possess, I want you to follow me in this prayer. We're going to join you. We're going to support you in this because this is a decision unequal and unparalleled. In, it is a decision bar none in its, in its importance because no experience is better than being born into the kingdom of God and experiencing all the beauty of His love, the joy, and the peace that it brings with it. So if you want to have that, I want you to just bow your heads. Bow your heads and pray this from your heart. Say it with your mouth. Say it loudly, but sincerely. Those of you who have done this before, support those doing those for the first time. We're praying all together, binding our faith together. And not only today, but in the days and years to come, people who watch this may receive Christ in their lives as well. Everybody just join me. Follow me in this prayer. Dear God in heaven, God of love, I want to experience that gift, your precious gift of love. I admit that I have sinned against you and I'm separated from you because of my sins but I want to call I want to come home I want to come home to your embrace so I open my heart to you today I invite you come into my heart come into my life I receive you as my only Savior and my Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. Restore me back in your love. Thank you so much for your salvation. Help me now to walk with you in this saving, living, loving, and joyful relationship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you're one of those people who did make that decision to receive Jesus in your life as Lord and Savior, we want to rejoice with you and congratulate you but because, as we said, there's no experience better than that. Let us know of your decision. So just make sure that you communicate to us in whatever way, telephone, your comments, or whatever, so that we could just help you and like walk with you in this beautiful journey. Congratulations once again. God bless.